Thank you for having me. <clears throat> this changed everything for architects. <laughs> Prior to 1950, there were only 70,000 of these worldwide. Prior to that, this is how we used to build buildings. This is the Monadnock building in Chicago. There are many examples like this. Um, but you look, it's an office building. This is the public space and the office space around it. It's a beautiful interior, lots of natural light, cross ventilation, um, uh, hoppers up above in the lobby, very, very open environment. This is what we built after that. This is a very famous building, the Seagram's building also in Chicago from about 1970. But if you look at the lobby, there's no light, no view, all artificial light, and basically the building's an energy hog. Um, so here's the difference between the two. I mean, which one do you want? Do you want this light-filled building or this one full of artificial light? I always like to say, you know, I asked anyone out there dislike uh, natural light or views or, you know, nice ventilation. It's a universal thing we respond to, but yet in modern buildings, <clears throat> this is often our solution. So when we do buildings, we're always looking at historical models of how we can make buildings respond better to their geographic region, the microclimate, um, to issues that make not buildings that are just beautiful, but that are also performative. And so, for example, when we did a school, we look back, and these are some things we found. This is a Philip Wheatley Elementary School built in 1955 by an architect named Charles Colbert in New Orleans, Louisiana. And air conditioning existed then, but they didn't use it. But they came up with this kind of plan that you can see not very different from the Monadnock building with the central court that has light and air, lots of cross ventilation, um, views, and so forth. And it really was a wonderful school um, and an environment, you know, great for kids to learn with views. We don't really build schools much like that anymore. We, we kind of close them up and not have views, not have light. Um, but somewhere along the way, some uh, bright and smart people decided that this building needed air conditioning. And this is what it looks like today. Um, the building didn't perform well because it wasn't designed to have air conditioning. And so when they put air conditioning in, it got hot hotter than there when the building did not have air conditioning. So they abandoned the building. This will probably be torn down. Um, there are other buildings. This is another really interesting school, also done in 1953 by Curtis and Davis in New Orleans. And it's just a beautiful plan, but you can see these are all the classrooms. And this is a stair that serves two classrooms. So it has... Uh, unlike schools we build today, almost no extra space. It's all usable space. And what they did was lift the building up in the air to kind of create this um, shaded porch for the kids. Air could flow under, air flows over, lots of light, ventilation. So it's a, not just a poetic space, but it also is performative. And I think that's what we always try to do, is look for ways where we can achieve both things. Um, my mother would call this Jewish common sense, you know, just. Uh, so we just finished this um, high school in, this is in a very poor neighborhood in Los Angeles, South LA, and it's really the neighborhood building. So we looked at those examples when we created this school adopting a lot of those same principles where the classrooms have light and ventilation on both sides, air flows induced through it, um, and there's lots of public space even on a very tight site. 
So this is what it looks like. This is the uh, west facing. The building's placed on the south part of the site, so it actually shades their, their small courtyard uh, without having to put a cover over it. Um, and these devices you can see here, this is a west shading device. So when you swing around in front of it, it is very open. And the classrooms, it allows light and views and this kind of filtered light take away the glare. And it's really a wonderful place for kids to learn. So um, they, they get light, they get air, um, but they also can get the privacy uh, on, of being in that space. As you swing around to the south, it has 650 solar panels built into the facade. And the building generates 70% of its own power. Um, it's a detail of the screen and the entry. So we look at ways to, you know, the, the solar panels I think are beautiful in themselves, but they also shade the building. So what we try to do is make our buildings passively efficient so that they're uh, not, we don't just do energy generation, but we bring the demand for the building down and then provide energy so that even without panels or other active devices, the building is very, very efficient. Um, and then the windows are built into those, the panels, and some windows are behind so that you get filtered light as long as, as well as some direct light and views with it. And then as you move around to the east, where the morning sun comes directly in, we have a system of horizontal fins that also shade the building. And you can see, once you go behind that, you get dappled light. Um, that also just makes it a comfortable and inviting place for kids to learn. Um, and I think that's really important, is your environment has a tremendous impact, not just on the people who occupy the space, but how they care for it as well. When they're comfortable in a building, they tend to um, take better care of their buildings. They take more pride in that. I grew up in Florida, and um, this is what I, I w I'm not quite that old, but this is, would be called the Florida vernacular house or a cracker house, and these were built purely out of necessity, where they raised the building off of the ground so that insects couldn't get in, but also air would flow through. You can see the big porch, shaded porch. It's also referred to as a shotgun house because you can literally shoot a shotgun right through the house and not hit any walls. But <clears throat> these homes are, you can't get more efficient uh, for a building. I don't think anything could exist more efficient than this. Um, the fireplace, there are no hallways in the house. But for me, it's an extremely poetic and beautiful uh, piece of work. It uh, has a certain simplicity um, and uh, its connection to the land. And when I was in grad school, I was doing work that I didn't even understand myself, but I was really fascinated of the things like the poetry of like living with nature. And, and this was a project I did in grad school called The Treehouse. And it embodies all the things today that would be considered sustainable architecture or sustainable design. I had no idea that term even existed then, uh, but I suppose I was doing it. I also worked for a couple architects in Florida. Um, this is one of them, Gene Leedy, who did these, you know, beautiful buildings, again, that coexisted with a really, really difficult, hot, sticky climate and created these beautiful courtyards um, and space where you think, you know, and Tennessee gets that too, it's very hot and humid, but that you can live outside. There are just, you can live with nature in a lot of ways. And so when we did our own home, my partner and wife, who's also an architect and grew up in Florida as well, um, 
we looked at some of these beautiful buildings that were being built in the 1940s and 50s, and this one is called the Umbrella House, done by Paul Rudolph in 1953. And what Rudolph did was go to a local tomato farmer and buy the tomato stakes for planting to build over his house what he called the umbrella. And it provided shade over this kind of beautiful uh, modern glass building. And, um, you know, very poetic, but also very simple. And when we did our own home, we thought of this and the potential of, of this idea is in California. And so we added on to a 450 square foot house. It's now 1,800 square feet. This is what existed and we added this piece. So we have two streets. We changed the entry. It has 79 solar panels on it now. And um, that's what it looked like before we started. This is what it looks like now. And we have a utility bill of less than $500 a year. Um, and the building is meant to really be more li like light on the land, more lines um, that float in space, vertical and horizontal lines. Um, it has, uh, besides the energy generation, all the rooms have natural light. We don't need to turn the lights on except for when it's dark. Um, all the rooms have natural ventilation. And because we're in California, Southern California, we could live outside. So our house is really an extension like of the garden. And you can see that it does really connect the inside and out. It's uh, quite compact. Um, this is from the living room. Um, this is our entry door. And that's our guest bathroom door right there. So you can see it's uh, hidden behind the bookshelf. And this, you know, all sustainable materials, natural materials, even the stair is perforated so that the heat rises through the two-story space, induces airflow, and it's just a very comfortable place to live. And I, I think that's really what we strive to do is make places that people really like. Uh, many of our clients could care less about, you know, being, doing something sustainable or uh, building responsibly, but they get it anyways from us. They just don't know they get it. Um, <laughs> we don't talk to them about it, but they get it anyways. Um, and that's our master bedroom. Um, we constantly look back at, at history there are great examples that you can use today that still work. Um, this is uh, a Bastakia in Dubai. This is from the 1600s. And you know, in the desert climate, they use these screens or these shading devices, again, that are multifunctional or multivalent. They're part of a rich history that has to do with geometry and aesthetics, but they also are performative. And they uh, not just provide shade, but they also, you know, women were really not meant to be seen, so they provide privacy. And so we use a lot of these techniques. We don't invent them. We just kind of give them new meaning or look at them in a more contemporary way. Um, so we did a, a, this, we're confronted really with a really nice project that had views of downtown Los Angeles and views of the ocean, but is on a very busy street um, in the Hollywood area. And it's like, so how do you give someone these incredible views, but also give them privacy? And um, that's a functional problem. What also I was fascinated with was this idea of a building that could move or something that would reflect the people who live there. And I started to look at other things. And uh, I, I, I looked at this artist called, named Patrick Hughes. And Patrick Hughes did these paintings called Prospectivity, where the paintings are actually fixed, but they move as you move past them. And 
let's see if I can make this move. They're built in a way where the, f the frames are built in reverse perspective and then they're painted in perspective. Mm, it's not gonna go for me. But as you move across them, the, the paintings appear to move, but they're really just fixed. And so I thought, can I make my building do a similar thing? And so this idea of this screen or shutter that people could actually operate themselves allowed the occupants to adjust to their own needs, to their climactic needs, but as well as their privacy, the kind of views they want. And as a result, the building kind of gets redesigned every day or every hour. And so it really becomes a reflection of the people who are there. And it's done through this really modest device of a you know, kind of shutter and a little space in doing and uh, providing for each of those people. We also recently just finished a proposal for a small chapel in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. That's our site. And it's an interfaith chapel, you know, and it's always puzzling to me, interfaith. It's like we want you to do something that's spiritual, spiritual but appeals to nobody. You know, it's like you can't, it can't be any denomination, but we want it to be appeal to everyone. And, you know, so I thought about things in any kind of religious activity. There always seemed to be the, the gowning or the costuming and the, the kind of rituals that go with it. So I thought, you know, the dress was really important. Even the, you know, wedding ceremony and could our building be like a, almost like a gown. Also thought about, you know, this image of the little white church on the hill that's so simple and poetic. And looked at other examples, again, going back to Sarasota, Florida, a building built by Victor Lundy in 1958, a Lutheran church um, that is a beautiful building, but you can see the shade line. Look at this, the porch. It's all glass, but all in shade. And it has this beautiful wood interior. And I, I got real fascinated with the, the wood ceiling and wanted to do something in wood. And looked, how can you do that? Um, and I found all kinds of examples. This is an, an armory building in Oregon done in 1926 where they use this technique called lamella, small pieces of wood built like trusses that could span these great distances. So we came up with this idea of making a building that would be like a gown, a formal gown, um, and doing it out of wood. Um, but we placed the building on the edge of the light, on edge of the lake, connecting it to other cosmic things like the North Star. The North Star or Polaris is the only star in the northern hemisphere that doesn't move. It's always at like 36 degrees north. If you look, you'll always see it. So we align windows with the North Star and also the summer solstice. But other things we did, and, and I'm sure you know this too, when it's very hot and you walk into a building with air conditioning, you for instantly freeze. And um, my house in Florida was always the one that had water running down on the inside of the glass. My mother kept it ice cold. Um, but we created this kind of transition, and you can see these di heating diagrams uh, give you, you come from the hot to a transition space before you cool, and then the building acts like a thermal chimney. So breezes can flow through, the heat rises and moves out of the building. So again, in an environment where it's a very tough climate, this is, becomes a very comfortable building, um, even without mechanical systems. So here it is on the lake. Um, and this is it as you approach it. You see the kind of dress lifts up where you enter underneath. And then the interior is this kind of wood, light-filled, somewhat mysterious volume of space. 
my office is in uh, or was in Santa Monica for 17 years and right next to the Santa Monica Museum of Art and they rolled this solar panel out every day. Um, I have no idea what it did <laughs> but they rolled it out with cones and all you know everything they set set this thing up and you can find these examples like everywhere this is a uh, solar powered camel delivering refrigerated vaccines in the desert and um, we were really inventive people we we find ways it's it's just incredible the things you can find all over the world like this but where we've kind of failed is more at an institutional level we've we've always found ways to not do this where it doesn't pay off so I'm gonna leave you with a a message or a quote that uh, one of our great architectural historians uh, said in an essay on architectural and civilization this is a, a 50 years old where he said that our architectural development is bound up with the, the course of our civilization to the extent that we permit our institutions and organizations to function blindly as our bed is made so must we lie on it the future of our civilization depends upon our ability to select and control our heritage from the past to alter our present attitudes and habits and to project fresh forms into which our energies may be freely poured thank you very much